Good morning, everyone from the North San Diego County Association of Realtors, and welcome to today's webinar, Cultural Differences with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Be sure to join us for tomorrow's Cultural Difference webinar with the Asian Real Estate Association of America, and on Thursday with the California Association of Real Estate Brokers. Also be sure to register for the 2020 North San Diego County Association of Realtors virtual awards show scheduled for November the 20th. To register for the upcoming webinar and the awards show, please visit the website at nsdcar.com. And now I'd like to introduce you to Noemi Chavez, NARP's 2020 president. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much, Shirley, and thank you, NSCCR, for the invitation to collaborate in this um, on this wonderful event. Um, you know, I'm very excited, and I would like to share a little bit about NAREP and um, and then introduce our other guest. Um, so, NAREP stands for the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. And we are the voice for Hispanic real estate and proud champions of home ownership for the Hispanic community. Um, our mission is, um, or our mission statement, um, NARP is a purpose-driven organization that is propelled by a passionate combination of entrepreneurial spirit, cultural heritage, and the advocacy of its members. Our mission is to advance sustainable Hispanic home ownership. NAREP accomplishes its mission by educating and empowering the real estate professionals who serve Hispanic, excuse me, <clears throat> home buyers and sellers, advocating for public policy that supports the trades association's, association's mission, and facilitating relationships among industry stakeholders, real estate practitioners, and other housing industry professionals. And um, today, you know, Norena, we have Norena, uh, Norena Limon, who is the public policy and industry relationships, um, or vice president, sorry, vice president of public policy and industry relationships. And um, we're going to share just with you guys, um, you know, a little bit more of the Hispanic and Latino community and what it is to work with us and you know what is going on in the you know in the market and um, on a po policy stand viewpoint. Um, so, without further ado, Norena, how are you today? I'm doing great. It's election day, so I am excited about uh, people getting out to the polls and celebrating our civic duty today. So, I today is a holiday for me every every election cycle. So, very pumped about. Uh, the excitement and the passion and, and getting out the Latino vote. <laughs> yes, um, it definitely, uh, it's a very exciting day. It's going to be interesting. Um, I'm sure, uh, well, I hope everybody that joins us today or that is watching this event, I hope everyone voted already. And, um, and if not, get out and vote. <laughs> yes, and if not, you still have until, when do they close the polls? I think 7? 7. 7. 7 p.m.? Yeah. So hope, you know, but if hope you get you to the polls, if you get to the polls and there's a long line, if you arrived before they close the poll, if you're there, it's your right to cast your vote. So as long as it takes, even if, even if you're in line for two, three hours till 11 PM, it is your right to cast the vote and your vote will be counted. So make awesome. sure, make sure you know that. <laughs> yes. That's very important for today. Um, all right, Norena, well, can you, um, can you give us some insight on what's going on in the, in the Hispanic, you know, community? Sure thing, Noemi. Thank you for, so first of all, thank you so much for your leadership. Hello, uh, North San Diego. Uh, and thank you so much for NSDCAR for hosting this event. And Noemi, you've done a fantastic job as president of the North San Diego NARP chapter. Uh, you are truly what we call in our community un orgullo hispano. So thank you so much for, for everything you do and for, for, um, uh, for your leadership uh, in this region. So I'm excited to talk about uh, the Latino uh, 
the Latino demographic and what it means to the real estate industry. At NAREP, we uh, release uh, a couple of reports a year. Uh, we released in the spring our State of Hispanic Homeownership Report. And in the fall, we've started to, to release our State of Hispanic Wealth Report. Uh, and in both reports, we underscore one important, uh, one important finding, which is that Latinos play an enormous role, not only in our current economy, but in the future of our economy. And there is no other industry where we see this more than in our industry, in the real estate industry. So uh, I am excited to share some of our findings from, from our report. And, and like Noemi said, uh, I, um, I run our policy and advocacy division within the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. We are a national trade association with over 40,000 members, 100 chapters around the country. Uh, and we have our headquarters right here in San Diego. So it is home for us. So we have not only our, our um, national headquarters, but we also have uh, amazing dynamic chapters such as the North San Diego chapter uh, in this area. So without further ado, let me dive into our reports. So please let me know if you can see this. Can you see this, Nami? Yes. All right. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about our um, State of Hispanic Homeownership Report. You know, after 12 consecutive years of declines that affected all population uh, segments, Latinos helped pull the nation out of a devastating housing recession in 2015 when they became the first demographic to uh, show an increase in homeownership rates. And over the past decade, uh, Latinos have accounted for over 50% of homeownership growth in America. In 2009, Latinos added a total of 1.9 million new homeowners during that period. In 2019 was no difference. Uh, Hispanics achieved a homeownership rate of 47.5, uh, which is, um, the Census Bureau actually just updated the 2019 uh, data to 48.1, and Latinos were the only demographic to have increased their homeownership rate for five consecutive years. So now we all know that housing is a big portion of the overall GDP. And this is extremely important because we're right now in the middle of a, of a recession. And housing has historically played a critical role in stimulating a, an economy that's in a recession. And we looked at the calculations that the National Association of Home Builders uh, have calculated uh, to show that housing actually makes up 16.3% of the GDP. Uh, we wanted to see what the Hispanic version of that or the Hispanic portion of that. And we saw that between 20, 2000 and 2018, Hispanics more than tripled their contribution to the housing share of the GDP. So increasing from 110 billion in contributions to the GDP in 2000 to 371 billion in 2018. So the growth in Hispanic housing contribution to the GDP has historically outpaced the overall market, which actually doubled at the same time that it tripled for Latinos. So now the question is why? You know, what, is, what are these increases in home ownership rate attributable to? And why are Hispanics the only demographics who have in, increased their, their home ownership rate for the past five consecutive years? Well, for one, Latinos have accounted for 40.4% of household formations. So this is a huge indicator uh, on housing demand, because when a household is formed, so that means that someone moves out of their parents' house and creates, an, you know, moves into a, an apartment, or they get married, or you know, move in with friends. Latinos are driving household formations, uh, so that is indicative of the huge role that Latinos play in driving housing demand. Latinos have also had the highest labor force participation over the past two decades. Income for Latinos increased, um, credit scores went up. All of these factors coupled with an unwavering desire for homeownership are reasons behind that growth. 
Now, of course, we are waiting to see what the results of the pandemic in 2020 is going to be on the Latino demographic. Uh, but all of the data leading up to 2020 showed that Latinos were doing really well in terms of home ownership rates and increasing uh, their home ownership numbers. And now we will see, uh, you know, we, we, we have some indications, which I'll talk about in a little bit in our state of Hispanic wealth, uh, that that growth has continued to happen. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're, we're keeping track of the uh, delinquency rates uh, to ensure that we're maintaining that home ownership growth, that home home ownership rate that we have up until now. So, in an effort to understand who these new homeowners were, uh, we partnered up with the Urban Institute, and we found that Latinos had a median age. The new Latino homeowners had a median age of forty, which was significantly younger uh, than homeowners in other demographics. These new homeowners were mostly US born. They had a median income of about 68,000 and were twice as likely to live in multi-generational households than other demographics. We also found that the um, greatest um, numbers of new homeowners came from the following markets. Uh, we found that Houston, Texas produced the single most new homeowners, new Latino homeowners. But if we look down to California, we did see that it was in, in the Inland Empire in Riverside, San Bernardino, Ontario, uh, where uh, the fourth highest number of la new Latino homeowners came from. Obviously, the housing inventory is a big issue here in California that might be keeping some of the numbers lower uh, because of how unaffordable housing has become. But another interesting uh, finding was that, you know, one of the reasons that housing inventory shortages uh, exist today, uh, it's, it's because of a labor shortage as well. Uh, we worked with the National Association of Home Builders and we found that some of the jobs, some of the construction jobs uh, where they're having the most acute shortages uh, were were jobs where the immigrant share of the workforce and the Latino share of the workforce uh, was extremely high. So if you look here in terms of drywall installers, uh, the immigrant share was 50% um, and 66% of home builders were reporting, uh, were reporting shortages in drywall install, uh, installers. So a lot of the restrictive immigration policies have actually made the labor, the construction labor shortage worse um, impacting and drawing, uh, driving a further um, impediment um, into new production of homes to keep up with this demand of housing that we talked about earlier today. We also wanted to see, you know, what are the low hanging fruit? And we found that as of 2018, there were 4.9 million Latinos that were mortgage ready Hispanic millennials in the US. So what we did is we, uh, we looked at, together with Freddie Mac, we looked at individuals that had the credit uh, characteristics to qualify for mortgage today. Uh, and, and that is how we got to this number. We also uh, made a list of the top 20 markets that had the most uh, Hispanic ready millennials. And we ranked it by housing inventory availability. So we found that um, markets, let's see, let me look here for a market in California. Fifth was the Inland Empire. Um, tenth was, uh, was LA. And those were the only markets in the top 20 in, in California. But I encourage uh, you to look at some of the other characteristics and some of the detail that we have in our report. We also found that Latinos are migrating, uh, you know, as, uh, as if you look at this, uh, at this map right here, California lost uh, 205,000 Latinos between 2015 and 2018. Um, and some of these gains uh, happened in states, um, in states such as Texas, which gained 102,000 uh, new Latinos. So Latinos are migrating. We're seeing an outflow of Latinos from California uh, as the price and the cost of housing increases at astronomical rates. 
So now I want to talk about the, the Hispanic Wealth Project and an exciting new report that we released uh, this fall in conjunction with our national conference and at Latitude. Uh, the Hispanic Wealth Project was an initiative that was established back in 2014 uh, and was an initiative to triple median household wealth for Latinos after Latinos lost over two thirds of their household wealth after the Great Recession. Now we relied on the survey of consumer finances to for the calculation of median household wealth. And when we first established this goal uh, in, in 2013, Latinos had a median household wealth of 13,700. So in order to triple median household wealth uh, by 2024, which was the 10 year goal that we set during that time, uh, Latinos would need to reach a 41,100 median household wealth. We just got the newest iteration of the Survey of Consumer Finances, uh, which was based, uh, of, based on data between 2016 and 2019, which found that Latinos now have a median household wealth of 36,200. This was a significant jump from the 2016 numbers and actually uh, Latinos have the highest growth out of any demographic in, in household wealth between that period. Once again, this is like a uh, this is like a wedding where the wedding we we think it's a happy ending, but we can't celebrate because we know what's going to happen. Uh, obviously, 2020 has brought a lot of uncertainty for the Latino community, so we will see uh, if this number holds uh, or if um, you know if this number will continue to rise in order to meet the 2024 uh, goal or if we will see some stagnation because we do see that the growth has continued to happen with a portion of the Latino community uh, but we have seen that a portion of the community has also been uh, disproportionately hit. So we for the first time uh, partnered with a polling company named uh, Morning Consult in order to conduct a survey a national survey uh, of Latino wealth. Uh, we surveyed over uh, 2,000 individuals nationally with an oversample of an additional 1,000 Latinos uh, in order to understand you know, some of these financial perspectives of, of how Latinos approach uh, money, how Latinos approach uh, wealth building and financial decisions. And one of the interesting findings uh, is that you know, many factors impact household wealth, such as income and asset building, which is primarily what we focus our report on. But education also plays a big role. For example, uh, Latinos in our survey with a bachelor degree had 48 times the wealth uh, as Latinos with a high school degree. And Latinos with a postgraduate degree had 61 times the wealth as those with a high school degree. So those are pretty astounding numbers um, and something, uh, you know, another factor that contributes to wealth for the Latino community. You know, one of the most astounding findings of the survey was that despite a 16 percentage point, point white Latino home ownership gap, uh, lower median household incomes and being nearly 14 years younger uh, than the overall population, Latinos in our survey were 25% more likely to own an investment property outside of their primary residence. So that was huge. I mean, we were very surprised by, by that finding. We've always known intuitively that Latinos are more likely to invest in uh, tangible assets, something that they can touch like real estate, something that they know. Uh, but we weren't expecting uh, for that number to be higher than the non-Hispanic white population. It is another reason why we are so concerned with some of the, um, the um, issues that small landlords are facing right now, because that is where uh, Latinos, when they build wealth, the little wealth that they have, they invest in real estate and one or two, a handful of uh, investment properties. Uh, so something that we um, are, are watching closely. We also found that Latinos were twice as likely as non-Hispanic white households. Uh, to report using any extra money to invest in real estate when given the option. And given how low interest rates are right now, we've all heard of the first first time home buying boom um, in the market. Uh, but 
unfortunately, right now, uh, you know, we are, um, you know, we're skeptical of, of some of the, the census data that we've been getting because of the changes in some of their methodology, but we were very um, optimistic after we saw uh, data from CoreLogic, which is loan level data or loan application data, and we found that between the second year of 20, uh, the second quarter of 2019 and the second quarter of 2020, uh, we did see that loan application went down significantly across the board. However, there was a there was a an uptick in the loan level application for first time home buyers and millennials, and in census tracts with a majority of Latino population populations, this uptick was almost double in most cases. So we find this as an indicator that, that Latino, uh, particularly Latino millennials and first time home buyers, that growth is continuing to happen within the Latino community. I'd also be remiss though, if, if I didn't mention, as I've hinted throughout this, this presentation, that uh, Latinos are also twice as likely as non-Hispanic homeowners to report being behind their mortgage due to the pandemic a rate that has corresponded with the Latino unemployment rate that we've seen uh, caused by the pandemic and Latinos being in, um, in, in um, occupations that have been the most impacted uh, by the pandemic. Another one of our findings is that family is at the center of Latino decision-making. We can't talk about wealth without having a conversation about the nuances of the Latino household and the massive role that familia plays in financial decision-making. So first of all, what does that mean? You know, Latinos on average are 33% larger than non-Hispanic white uh, households. And in our survey, in our Hispanic Wealth Project survey, Latinos were 77% more likely to live in a multi-generational household uh, than the non-Hispanic white populations. We also asked our survey participants what they do with their money when they have extra money to invest. And we gave them a whole host of options and 44% of Latinos reported using it to help a family member. And then there's this, uh, more than any other population surveyed, Latinos were the most likely to report that they were expecting to take care of an elderly parent in retirement. Now, this is significant when we talk about financial planning, when we talk about income shocks later on in life, um, and we talk about how ready for retirement Latinos are. We also asked our survey participants about their particip participation rates in various financial assets. So if you look at this graph uh, over here, I'm looking that way because my, my screen is that way. <laughs> uh, the difference in participation rates is generally on par with uh, the rest of the population according to our survey. However, when we calculated the total value of retirement accounts, of brokerage accounts, of real estate investments and checking accounts, uh, the non-Hispanic white um, total value of these assets was five times than that of the Latino family. Now, a lot of things can explain this, but one of the things that uh, we, we think is the reason behind that is that, like we've said before, Latinos are, are 14 years younger than the non-Hispanic white population. Latino median age is 29.8. So we do believe that as the Latino community ages, so will the value of these assets. What we need to worry about is ensuring that Latinos maintain those participation rates, uh, particularly in assets such as retirement accounts. We also found that there is a knowledge gap um, versus a lack of funds, which is what's driving low Latino participation rates in, in stock-based investments. So whereas 50% of the general population in the non-Latino, uh, sorry, whereas more than 50% of the, of the non-Hispanic white population uh, reported that they didn't invest in retirement accounts or in brokerage accounts but because they didn't have um, enough funds to invest in, in these. 
Latinos were more likely to uh, report reasons such as they didn't think it was a safe investment or they didn't know how to invest in these products or they simply had never heard of a 401k or a brokerage account. Another thing that we, uh, that we looked at is, is debt. So in the same vein around financial uh, education, we also found that Latinos were 41% more likely to have auto debt than their non-Hispanic white counterparts um, and 83% more likely to have student loan debt. You mean not all debt is equal. We can, we can say that student loan debt um, is a positive, can be a positive. Uh, mortgage debt is a positive as it increases your, um, your household wealth. Uh, but we are watching um, auto loan debt uh, because we can argue that an auto takes you from you, you know, to your uh, place of employment uh, and is a critical asset, but it, 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 is, it, is, um, it does depreciate the minute that uh, a car is driven out of the dealer. So um, it is something that we are watching um, and something that we, we are working on when it comes to our Hispanic Wealth Project initiative. And finally, let's talk about the Noemi Chavez's of the world. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about Latinas who are outpacing uh, Latinos uh, when it comes to the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, Latina-owned businesses uh, with employees have grown twice as fast as employer businesses owned by non-Latinas, and Latinas outpace job creation by increasing the number of employees by 41.3% since 2012, higher than, than their Latino counterparts. Our survey uh, found that Latinos were, were um, also more than twice as likely as their non-Hispanic white counterparts to be inclined to invest in a business when they had extra, extra income to invest. The pandemic, however, has taken a toll on small businesses, as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, according to the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative, only one in six Latino-owned businesses reported having um, enough cash flows to be able to survive the next six months. Um, so something that is sure to impact future home ownership growth or the stability of households uh, across the nation. Now, COVID-19 pandemic has threatened the progress Latinos have made in closing the wealth gap. Not only have Latinos been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 from a health perspective, with an infection rate three times that of the non-Hispanic white population, but Latinos are also six times as likely, more likely to die from COVID-19 among those that are aged under 55. Economically, Latinos uh, were more likely to be considered essential workers and experience a reduction uh, or a loss of income. And most strikingly, only 28.9% of Latinos have been able to work from home compared to 48.7% of white workers. Many Latinos have also depleted their savings as a result um, from the start of the pandemic. So when we asked Latinos about some of these trends around savings, the survey found that 46% of Latinos compared to 42% of white respondents are, are responding to COVID-19 by drawing on savings. But again, family. Family is how Latinos are getting through this pandemic and are being resilient through this outsized impact that the, that the pandemic has had on the community. Uh, we found from our survey that 70% uh, of Latinos were, were, sorry, Latinos were 70% more likely to report pulling money together to help families pay bills uh, through, through the pandemic, more so than non-Hispanic white families. But beyond all of this, and notwithstanding all of this, Latinos remain optimistic. 35% of Latino households reported expecting to be better off economically a year from now compared to 23% of the non-Hispanic white population. Latinos are also forward-looking. This is an important one for all the real estate professionals. 
uh, 40% of Latinos that don't currently own a home plan to buy within the next five years. And also Latino renters are overwhelmingly saving to buy a home as their primary reason for saving compared to 47, sorry, compared to 33% of non-Hispanic white renters. So there's a lot of takeaways from all of this. Uh, first, we need to invest in culturally relevant financial education. We need, we need to support the growing number of Latino homeowners and entrepreneurs through the pandemic. And we need to create a financial marketplace that understands the nuances and the extended role that familia plays in Latino decision-making, which I know is going to be a critical conversation that Noemi and I will have as we talk about working uh, within the nuances of the Latino community. So it goes without saying uh, that we cannot talk about the future of our economy without talking about the role that Latinos play uh, not only in driving demand and consumer consumption, but in the role that Latinos are going to play in revitalizing our economy uh, because of the labor force participation rates, because of the youth of the Latino population, uh, and, and because of the critical role uh, that Latinos will continue to play in driving home ownership growth. So without further ado, I'm excited to talk to you, Noemi, about our findings, um, to answer some questions from all, you, all of you about our findings and uh, get this conversation going. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, to present all these findings. Yes, um, Norena, that was amazing. I, you know, those are incredible numbers and um, it's amazing to see, you know, how well our, our Hispanic Latino community has been doing in the past, you know, five years and that they're still driving, right, the market. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to, to see the, the report for, you know, for, for this year. I know that things are going to be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, there's so many, you know, factors right now that, um, you know, that obviously can um, impact, right, this, this progress that our community had been doing throughout the years. Um, and, you know, there is no denying that there are a lot of uh, cultural differences as well, right, with, with our um, Hispanic um, clients. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, being a part of NAREP and, and being more involved also with our local association has really empowered me and given me the opportunity to learn more um, about the clients that we serve, mm -hmm. you know, whether, and not, not just Hispanic, right? But we do have to understand the, the differences and yeah. it is important to know those numbers. Um, and, you know, one, one thing that I can say from my own experience, not only working with, in the past with the Hispanic um, clients or community, but also as a, you know, first born um, or first generation born here in the United States, um, it's, you know, there's still a lot of things that we need to learn um, how to, uh, how to manage credit, what, you know, your, your debt, what, what are, what is all that about, right? And, and one thing that <clears throat> when we, you know, our families come to this country, yeah. um, we're kind of, you know, we see all the beautiful shiny things and, you know, the American dream, how you can have yeah. everything and anything but we don't understand the implications of that, right? You mentioned um, in towards the end about the 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 debt to loan okay. ratio and oh, yeah. you know the the vehicle or the cars um, being one of them. You know, sometimes we don't understand how how those things work. Um, so we do have to. Um, educate our clients more as well. And, and, and I think part of that education will increase um, the opportunities for Hispanics to be able to buy, you know, 
absolutely in your homes. Um, and you did mention, I mean, a lot of the, uh, the decision making is it's not only just one or two people, but it's sometimes like the whole family because uh, there is also a lot of um, multi generational living, right? We have the the abuelitos and you know sometimes the tias sometimes yeah, the tias. <laughs> so it, it's and and everybody is kind of. Um, putting right their funds together too to make this dream possible. Yeah. Well, especially here in California where, you know, I, I wanted to underscore the fact that, you know, while we, it, it's pretty evident when, um, when lenders especially look at these, look at the data that um, the future of the housing market rests on Latinos, given the growth that we've seen around the country, uh, you know, many of our home ownership rates. I mean, if we um, if we uh, look at the home ownership rate, we're basically have surpassed our pre um, two thousand and eight um, um, home ownership rate numbers. Uh, we haven't seen this in California. In California, the the Latino home ownership rate still um, lags far behind what it was before the the, the Great Recession, and a lot of that is because of um, how unaffordable California has become and how the, the, the housing shortage that, uh, has is probably the most acute and the most, um, uh, you know, most drastic in the state of California than in, in other, um, any other state in the country. Uh, but, you know, we look at that and we're seeing that the, the trends are, are the, the trends across the board around the country, we're seeing the Latinos are driving home ownership growth. So definitely there is a desire for home ownership. Um, and that's not necessarily um, the case in California because of the housing stock problem. And when we have a state that is, um, you know, has some of the highest Latino populations uh, in, in the country, that's problematic and doesn't bode well for the future of the California economy. Hence why, you know, promoting homeownership opportunities for Latinos in the state of California, working on solving our housing shortage crisis, um, passing critical zoning reform uh, bills is so critical not, and will have an impact on every Californian uh, and in the whole country because the California economy also impacts the, the rest of the, of the country. Uh, but like you were saying, in order to afford home ownership in California, many Latinos are pulling money together um, and are coming together and are being entrepreneurial in the way that they're, they're figuring out how to become homeowners, which is um, pretty remarkable. Yeah. And, you know, that was an incredible number to see. You said 230,000 Hispanics left. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, it would be um, interesting to see, right, kind of, well, I guess your map did show it. I guess you can assume, right, the states where they are going to. Yeah. Um, but it's not even just to other states. But, for example, here in San Diego, particularly, mm -hmm. you know, we have, you know, we're five minutes away from the border, from Mexico. But yeah. a lot of people also once, you know, if you can't afford a home here in, in California and San Diego specifically, you know, people then start considering even just that lifestyle of living in, in Mexico, living in Tijuana and commuting every single day. And sometimes I think that's a, it's a shame because, you know, yeah. we're, that, that is money that, or, you know, that, that the state is losing as well, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting, especially I think California, well, I guess you can say border as well, border town um, states, right? Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of it throughout it and, and the numbers are probably quite interesting as far as- and national individuals. Yeah. 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 Um, well, another thing that I wanted to, um, talk about and discuss is last year there's a lot of buzz and excitement for yeah. a congressional hearing that happened that um, NARUP along with a few other uh, associations uh, 
was a part of. And I would love for you to share a little bit about that and just how NARP is just getting more involved with, um, with policymaking. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Noemi. Yeah, it, it was exciting last year. So the uh, House Financial Services Committee uh, did a, um, a hearing to understand what, um, what, is, uh, what are the major barriers to minority homeownership growth. Uh, and so we had the opportunity to, um, to testify before Congress uh, on not only some of these um, incredible numbers that we shared today, particularly the fact that you know, we cannot talk about homeownership in America without understanding the Latino community, without understanding uh, the fact that uh, Latinos are purchasing homes with a median 3.5% down payment. Um, so the, uh, the availability of these affordable loan products is so critical so that Latinos can continue driving uh, the market. To understand the nuances of, of Latinos, um, so our past president, Joe Neary, uh, testified uh, before Congress and, and talked about these statistics, um, talked about the fact that Latinos, um, and some of the, 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 the biggest barriers for Latinos is, um, you know, some of the um, restrictive policies uh, that make it very hard for small business owners to, to qualify for a loan or at least delay the process of being qualified for a loan. So today's uh, underwriting guidelines are kind of meant for people who are W-2 earners. And if you're not a W-2 earners, the process becomes very difficult. A lot of that, not to get wonky uh, with all of this, but a lot of that has to do with uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's um, definition of qualified mortgage has a um, specific um, uh, a clause in there called Appendix Q, uh, which um, informs lenders how to document um, income and debt, um, and so with um, or income especially. And so with self that that document or that clause uh, was a, a holdover from an old FHA rule that has already been updated in, from FHA to up to, up, until, up until now. So it's very outdated. Um, so it makes it very difficult for, for lenders to really know how to document um, uh, income for self-employed borrowers. So anyways, uh, we talked about that. We talked about Latinos um, uh, having a proclivity to um, operate in a cash economy um, and how that impacts um, credit scores and credit scoring models that are also very outdated. Uh, and we talked about also what we just talked about right now, Noemi, the, uh, the fact that Latinos uh, live in multi-generational households um, and how it becomes difficult sometimes to um, really encompass all of the various incomes that are going to be contributing to a, a mortgage when calculating a person's ability to repay. Um, and again, you know, the, the thing that I think is the biggest barrier, which is housing inventory, and no other state is that a bigger problem than in, in California. So this is kind of what we talked about um, in Congress. It was um, very exciting to have that opportunity. And yes, we are growing and building our advocacy efforts nationwide, um, not only in, um, in terms of our advocacy in Washington, D.C., and strengthening our voice there, uh, but also at the local level, ensuring that we have strong relationships with our elected officials um, in our chapters, uh, in, in city by city, uh, that they know who NAREP is, they know about our mission, and they understand um, that, that NAREP, which is the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, I just saw in the Q&A that someone asked, uh, to, to give our acronym, that NARP is much more than a real estate association. We are what we call a wealth building organization. Our mission is to advance sustainable Hispanic homeownership because homeownership is the number one way that Latinos build wealth. You know, as part of our organization, we also have our Hispanic Wealth Project, uh, where we talk about the power of diversifying our assets um, much to what we talked about in the in the wealth report, um, and to talk about some of these other financial empowerment or financial education issues like minimizing debt, 
um, like, um, you know, having a mature understanding of wealth. Um, so that is a, a lot of our exciting initiatives that we're doing there is to try to spread what we call our NARP 10 disciplines um, to communities and Latino communities across the nation, um, which are which is a roadmap to how to uh, how to triple our household wealth, how to live a successful life, um, also within um, the context of our cultural sensitivities. So, um, yeah, all of that to say is <laughs> that's, that's amazing, and you know, it, it just shows the power of our organization mm -hmm. and how invested, right? We are, and really. Um, uh, supporting sustainable Hispanic home ownership. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to to be a part of NAREP and but also you know um, be a part of, of our local association and and collaborate and and help each other out because at the end of the day um, you know we we are in this business and we should know, um, our clients, we should know the numbers, and we should um, try to do what we can to change, you know, our mark, our some of the policies, some, some of the things that affect us in the market. Um, so, you know, that's, that's very exciting that that NAREP is, is so involved, and that continues to grow and it continues to get us more involved. I know you have done, um, you particularly have done a wonderful job um, at doing it. You, um, you know, like whenever there's, um, and I guess we can talk about this, right? Like what can we do yeah. as practitioners, as real estate agents, as, you know, lenders, what can we do to get more involved with um, some of these obstacles? Um, yeah. Sometimes we don't even know, right, what propositions are out there. Honestly, now the only reason why I know what's going on is because of your, um, your, you know, the, the, um, I'm sorry, it's not the survey. When you send the, we get like a little text all the time. Um, oh yeah, the the campaigns that we do. Yes, just the, the campaigns that you send. I mean, that's when I really, oh, okay, well, this is going on. So yeah. Can you, yeah. can you tell us what, what else can we do or what can we do? Absolutely. Well, I think number one is as, um, you know, anybody that's committed to, um, to advancing um, homeownership rates within uh, communities of color, uh, you, in, you live in California and you work in California, you have to get involved in the um, solving our housing crisis conversations that we've been having in California, uh, working on zoning reform, um, working on the on, on simulating the production of more housing, um, that the serious deficit of, 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 of housing that we have in California is extremely problematic. And we also need to ensure that, you know, we show up, we show up to city council meetings, uh, we showed up to our um, representatives uh, and, and tell them about your experiences in the market. Put a human face behind um, individuals that are, you know, credit worthy, that, that are having a hard time finding a home, um, and the fact that we need, we need to do more about it. You know, in the state of California, unfortunately, um, everybody understands that there is a housing shortage in the state. I mean, you have to be blind to not see it, right? There's a housing shortage, housing prices are out off the roof. Um, and there's different camps in California. There is the camp that is um, unfortunately the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard, people who don't want more building. They want their neighborhood to stay the way that it is. It worked for them. They don't want more housing. Um, and they unfortunately are very loud. They show up to city council meetings. Um, they, whenever there is any state bill, and, and we've been involved as NAREP on many of those campaigns around um, housing production. And you know, we we show up to uh, hearings, and and we we um, you know we call our representatives, but we're hearing that the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard um, individuals, are are calling the representatives in droves hundreds, thousands of calls. And um, 
folks that are promoting density and promoting zoning reform, um, unfortunately, are not as loud. And we need to do something about it because we can't continue with the rate that we're going. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem not only for uh, renters, it's a problem for homeless, homelessness, and it's a problem for, um, for future homeowners. Um, but we also need to talk about um, the fact that you know, our housing crisis um, has to be uh, resolved um, not only for renters, but also for homeowners. There needs to be a sufficient stock for first time homeowners um, so that they contribute, they can continue building wealth and we can think about, about our long-term uh, wealth building um, prospects in the state. So call your, call your representative, um, be involved. There is going to be a slew of housing bills that are going to be introduced again in California in January. So respond to the various calls to action, call your representative, um, show up to a city council meeting and make them um, understand the value of not only addressing the, the, the housing shortage from a rental perspective, but also from a home ownership perspective. Um, you know, it's part of our, it has to be part of our business plan because it is impacting um, the mission behind what we do. Uh, and so yeah. we need to make sure that we're giving them homes. You don't, we don't get paid too, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the reality. So that's mm -hmm. why it's so important to um, understand the numbers, understand what's going on, get more involved. And, exactly. you know, this is great. Um, all the information you, you've given is just amazing. Um, we do have a question um, from Donna. So it says, would it be best to put a bilingual lender together for the families of multi-generational members? Um, I would say yes. Whenever you are dealing with your, with you know, the Hispanic, um, even if they're fluent in, in English, I do think it, it is always best to partner them up or to have um, a bilingual lender speak mm -hmm. to them so that you know, they kind of, they really understand and, you know, they feel more comfortable because it is a big decision and there's multiple decision makers. There's, like we mm -hmm. said, there's, you know, different um, family members contributing to, to, to purchasing this, you know, a home. Yeah. So I, you know, personally, yes, um, I do see that when, when they are not working with the bilingual lender, then they just have so many more doubts and they're more hesitant to actually pull the trigger and, and do the things that, um, that they need to do, right? Sometimes to kind of push them to be ready to yeah. um, qualify. So I, I definitely think so. Yeah. Um, so we're about to wrap it up. If anyone else has any questions, um, we did also share um, the link to um, our advocacy committee for NARA, whoever wants to join and get more involved. Um, as chapter president, I've had to, you know, we do have um, one of our board members is our gov government affairs and you know, he keeps me updated and, um, you know, I, it's been a journey also for me, just kind of trying to get more involved and really know what is going on. Um, yeah. you know, and, and now, especially with this pandemic, it's going to be very interesting to see kind of what next year is going to look like. Right. Um, yeah. Well, know. regardless of what happens, we need to keep our elected officials accountable. And uh, we need to make sure that we have a relationship with our elected officials, uh, that, we, uh, that we know what policies are impacting our industry. You know, at the National Advocacy Committee within NARAP, we do our best to inform our members um, through in, in, in terms of local initiatives through our government affairs directors. But it's so important that you stay involved, that you speak up. Uh, you know, one of the, um, I spoke to a city council member once who told me, you would be surprised with how many stupid laws get, get implemented because one person showed up and gave a 40 minute rant about some random thing. Uh, and it, it's just showing up. I mean, think about your life. 
half the battle is showing up. Uh, and if we don't show up, if we don't speak up, uh, then then we, I mean, we can just complain about it, but nothing's going to, nothing's going to happen. Uh, so just, we need to be a part of the solution. We know there's a housing shortage in, in, in California. We know that's the biggest impediment to increasing these numbers. So let's do something about it. Yeah. What would you say is, um, just to kind of wrap it up, um, what would you say is the best way to actually know when these meetings are happening or when something is going on? Because you know, it's also depending on all the, all the different cities, right? Depending on where yeah. you live. I mean, um, so do you go directly to the page and, yeah. you know, kind of register for notifications? Do you, do you, have you seen um, yeah. anything? If you care about housing inventory, I would say um, if you, in terms of the city, uh, go to the city page, the city website, and find out when, you know, various hearings are happening or when various town halls are happening. Um, and, and, you know, you can, sh you can sign up for newsletters or you can sign up for alerts uh, for when these things happen. When it comes to various national, uh, sorry, various statewide campaigns um, around um, housing inventory, I would say the California YIMBY organization, the Yes in My Backyard, um, is very good about informing everybody about what's happening. I mean, at NARA, we try to uh, inform and, and rile up our organization whenever we have a major uh, campaign going on. But when it comes to your city council, go to the website. Go to the website, introduce, call your city council member and introduce them, introduce yourself um, and tell them that you care about these issues and you want to be able to speak at a city council meeting about this issue and they will tell you. They will tell you when to show up. Uh, but like I said, half the battle is showing up and calling them. Yeah. Actually, now that I remember, um, I did do that. I did call my, um, because to go to, so NARP has every year, right? We have our policy conference where we go to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to visit the White House. <laughs> and we had to, um, you have to get um, like a, permit and kind of have to go through your your councilman yeah so I, that was the first time I actually looked up the information and and made the phone call and actually reached out so um I I, I almost forgot that I guess because I was right in the beginning of the year when this whole thing happened but um so thank you Norena thank you um for the presentation thank you for um, being a part of NARA for helping, you know, with this event and collaborating with our local association. Um, NSDCR has been a great, um, a great partner of NARA. And we had a lot of plans for this year, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can, you know, retake on some of that stuff for next year and, and continue collaborating. I know we're still all trying to figure it out a little bit. Um, and we're all kind of, you know, seeing what's going to happen. <laughs> it's like our new normal, right? It's so hard to plan because, you know, know. Even for like our events, right? Right now, that you, if you want to plan for next year, it's like, well, will we still be doing Zooms? We'll be able to do them in person. But whatever it is, um, I'm very happy to be a part of NARP and I'm very happy to be a part of NSCCAR. Um, so thank you, everybody who joined us. Um, there are some links on the chat box if you want to join our advocacy committee. Um, and also if you want to join uh, Yimby, Yes in My Backyard. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. And stay tuned for tomorrow's event with Aria. That is going to be very interesting as well to see the numbers and how, you know, the Asian American community is doing as well. Thank you so much, Noemi. And reach out to five people who you know haven't voted and make sure that they vote today. Yes, make sure to vote. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.